So the body of the bottle, how do you make it anyway? You could, obviously in a throwing class, you would be throwing. Uh, in a hand building class, there's slab building technique. How do you make this form? What is the form? I'm gonna make a simple tube and I'm gonna belly it out a little bit using this uh, Pringles can and some paper. And you've seen this technique. I'll just roll it up. I'll make that form, put a bottom on it, bubble up a top, make a top, and think about a neck. What is a bottle? You know, where does a bottle have a spout? Is it a bottle that's more of a ewer, like a bottle with a spout, little spout on it? Uh, is it a flask? Is a flask a bottle? Does it have a foot? Does it have a flat spot or does it fit in your vest pocket? Does it hang from a chain? Does it, um, is it a perfume bottle that hangs from a chain? It's a little teeny bottle, has a little spout, a little cork, and has some patchouli in it or something. <laughs> anyway, uh, so there's different ways to really approach it. And there's all these uses and the conceptual directions that you use on the surface of the bottle can be the same as what you use on a cup. So as your concept is developed, that's the other thing. What are you doing with this bottle? Uh, conceptually or aesthetically, how are you playing with the composition of the bottle? So the bottle has these elements. And so I'm gonna cover that visually here really quickly for you, all right? Just to reiterate this technique, I do like to have more of a flat bottom and I'm gonna cut this off and save this piece for the bottom and the top anyway. So I like to have the starting flat and, and this is gonna work really well for another piece. So save your slabs. Um, uh, and this size of a piece, depending on how much bellying out I'm gonna do, uh, I'm gonna keep it at a little less than a quarter inch thick. I can think about using the newspaper itself to figure out how much of a piece I need, or I can start somewhere and I can roll it, or I'm gonna do it a real simple way. I'm just gonna cut a straight edge here. And again, thinking about reusing this clay, I'm gonna try and do a right angle, so I'm making these marks line up on that line. And I only wanted about this tall, so I'm not worried about any of this up here. And I might save this for certain elements, like candles or small spout that I'll demonstrate too. What I do like is for this here to be at a 45 degree angle, so I might move it if it's a quarter inch and I just cut it. Um, I move the ruler at a quarter inch and I put my knife so the point the point of my knife is seen right at the edge and I drag that along it'll be a, uh, a 45 degree angle so now you see there's this nice angle I like that angle because then on the other part make the opposite angle and they fold over and they, they meet up really nice and the joint is uh, a little stronger joint, but also a joint that kind of gets concealed. Instead of a butt joint, it's a miter joint and there's less of that joint ever popping up after it's bisque fire. All right, then I simply take that, as you saw from previous demonstrations, I lift that slab. I don't want it so high, so I guess I should cut off this first. Again, I'm going to think about, whoa, how high I want that bottle. I'm gonna use that line. I'm gonna do that kind of thing there. So I get it straight. Well, feasibly, you can also have come from here, marked up to there, and I'll just show you that what I did works too. So that says 11 inches, so it'll be 11 inches high. If I mark it way over here, it says 11 inches also. So different ways to think about it. You could actually use a square to square it up too. All right, now I am ready to roll this up onto whatever tube, or it could be a squared off tube too. I'm gonna take it, gently get it up onto the tube. 
and then I'll, I'll tighten it up once I get it up in the air like that. And again, I will just pull it a little tight and I will roll it. And when I mark it, the clay itself is going to mark it. So I'll roll on there and it leaves this mark so I know where to cut, okay? Show, show you that. I don't normally lift this up in the air, but you see the mark where it, it made this mark. So know where to cut for this. Now, again, this is a 45 going under, so I would make this 45 so it could slip under there, and I can just guesstimate, you know. And again, I have this extra slab here. So sometimes I'll just open that up and I'll wrap it on a smaller piece like this. I can just go ahead, wrap it around and get that clay scored and slipped if it's drier. So I'll take that joint, I'll score it and slip it now, and then I'll compress this joint together to make a really good solid joint. Score, score. I do like these quicker scoring tools, these wire. They work pretty well. Uh, it is better to really dig in with a needle tool and a fettling knife and really get it scored a little better, but um, this clay is flex wet enough and flexible enough to go on here, so there it's pretty good to or you know, slip at this rate. All right, so you're gonna watch me do this. I'm gonna push that joint together, push that joint together. I'm not gonna work it quite yet. I just wanna make sure that it's all lined up so my 45 overlaps well. The cool thing about this, again, from the original demo I talked about, you know, you have this hard object in here, this tube that you're working with, or a rectilinear or a square nail pattern. That square mold underneath there, or form, um, you can press against, and so it's kind of like doing something against a table where you can really manipulate a joint. You can also think about now rolling this onto some texture or rolling texture on here or doing some kind of uh, surface work while it's still on here. That surface work that I've shown you with um, sort of uh, printmaking techniques, uh, model printing, all that. You could think about having a sheet of glass that you did a a model print on and you can just roll that on there. You know, you can pull up that surface from a painting and you can repeat that painting over and over with that kind of technique, right? So don't forget about all the other things that I've demonstrated for you and where you go with that. So again, see you see how I'm smoothing out the surface of this body for the bottle. Again, I can think about a nice smooth table, and if I roll it, it starts to thin out the slab too against this, and it, you can see that it's going to slide out really easy. If it does kind of feel tight, you're gonna have to do this to thin out the slab sometimes to get it to come off. Remember that paper has to slide on these forms. All right, so the outside joint here is next to perfect. I'm gonna use the actual um, form itself to think about holding one area in. I could, if I wanted to dart this area and have this curve in as the top or the bottom, I could do that now. If I cut out four triangles and fix this in, obviously the can won't slide out that way now, it would slide out this way only. Right, 
So I'm just going to show you, take that can out. If your clay is extra wet, you may not want to take it out right away. the cap to the Pringles can stayed in there. All right, so this is the other trick. Don't forget this. If you are taking the paper out right away, you don't want to just yank on it because you can manipulate this tube too much. I just lift it lightly, twist that paper, and then it comes out along with the cap. All right, so now I have that basic body of a bottle. Do I ovalize it? Do I square it? Do I belly it out? Um, there's all these different ways to work it. What I do like to do is, before I do anything, fix the seam on the interior. I like to use a finger, like made out of wood, to get in there. Uh, I talked to you about stiff paint brushes to really manipulate interior or exterior joints. So this um, paint brush, if it was a little stiffer, I could get in there and work it. If I can't make it all the way down the bottom before I put a bottom on, I can certainly flip it over now. And again, on a certain scale, I can make these, you know, six feet tall with a six foot tall tube too, right? Um, and it'd be harder to flip over, but so get that joint really manipulated in before I do anything. And that's pretty, critical. So if you look at this, uh, gently pick it up, check the other side, check that joint, get the potato chip crumbs off of it. But if you look at that, that's a you know really nice cylindrical way to work. Um, but if I want to belly out and play with it, you know, I can use a rib, I can belly it out and start to play with it. Um, instead of just having a straight tube. Uh, that might be what you want with your form. So that's something to think about where I go with that. And this is a harder one to get in to really belly out, but I'm gonna belly it out a little here. And I'm gonna try to make it belly out evenly at a certain level. So it's two different forms. Now we got four underneath a straight form. So I'm just kind of keeping my hand here at a certain distance from the top here. It starts to kind of take on a tulip y shape, right? Like a tulip uh, vessel. Almost. So I'm gently moving that clamp. And again, this does work better with more of a porcelainous stoneware or a porcelain to belly it out. Sometimes that shop stoneware stretches uh, at a certain rate and that stretch is a little uh, um, cracky here. If you do find cracking happening while you're stretching the clay, you can then again work the exterior to really sled out those shapes. So again, I tried to do it so that's the bottom to get my bottle to have a little belly on the bottom. And you see that one way to go, go and play with that shape, okay? So for the bottom, I can think about feet. I can think about just a flat bottom. I'm just gonna keep it really simple and um, do a flat bottom. So I'm gonna take this Get rid of, again, let's see, potato chips. Clean out, if you use a potato chip can, then clean it out. <laughs> Just in case the crumbs get in your way. Okay. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to flip it back over again. I'm gonna score this area where it's gonna join to the bottom. That's why I add this background music. Uh, so I have a track that I use and I 
play different instruments and because of copyright I can't really use somebody else's music. I could use like a garage band kind of free stuff, but anyway, if you don't like it, I'm sorry, but I'll just add that to keep that hum from the fluorescent <laughs> of annoying you. Maybe the music is more annoying. Anyway. I like playing guitar and mandolin and bass and all these things. And so, I just add it. Anyway, okay, so I slipped. All that scoring, I slipped, and now I'm going to be able to put it on here and gently just push on it and then take it off. Okay? You see it. This piece. You see that it marks where now I need to score on there. So this is just that trick where, you know, you don't want to have too much cleanup to do. Um, and this saves you some cleanup time. So I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to slip it again after I've scored it. So I'm getting that surface and this surface, nice. Let's reiterate why. Why do we score and slip? I know some people don't score and slip enough. They don't, they score really weak and they slip really conservatively. And you don't want to be conservative. You want to be really liberal. You want to be open to getting enough glue in there. So you want to be liberal with that, okay? All right, so I actually wipe some of it away. So again, I don't have a lot of cleanup, but I, I just want it to be really close. So I'm gonna put it down there now, exactly on that line. And what I like to do with that scoring is I'll push down gently. And you see that I just, I'm doing this, there's no edits here. This is all in one sitting. So I haven't waited for this clay to stiffen up. So the clay is at that nice, out of the bag, it's wet enough that I can belly this. It's wet enough that this joint is going to get pretty good and tight. Now, uh, like I said, you know, a stiff paintbrush, I can't get in there with my finger to work the interior joint. But you should work your joints from the inside and the outside. I like to work them from the inside first. Really kind of working them. And it's hard to see down in here because it's... But I'm just kind of looking in there and getting a longer paintbrush down in there. And then again, this is a stiff paintbrush. It kind of acts like my finger. All right, so now I can feasibly cut that off. Um, what I sometimes do is I cut a little extra and leave like maybe a 16th of an inch of clay so I can work that clay up onto the piece and get even a stronger joint at the bottom of my fork. Well, back to thinking on how you manipulate your coils. And this is a similar idea that just leaving a little extra clay to, to manipulate that clay up onto the form. And so you can see this, bring it closer, you see this little edge. I'm gonna take that with my finger and I'm gonna move it up, move it up, move it up, move it up, work all the way around potato chip crumb out of there <laughs> and move it all the way around don't forget to do the whole joint before you do any kind of sledding or surface uh, fixing Now, after I've got it worked with my finger, then I'm going to manipulate it with the rib a little and smear that in more. And although I want to try and do this all in one sitting without any edits, I'm going to say that this area is going to stay a little sloppy until I'm done. And then I will do some reductive work and kind of refine that joint a little more 
So for a visual reason, not for a strength reason. So this is a strength reason. All right, so now for the top, do I want it just flat and then the neck of the bottle coming off of there? Do I want it domed? If I want it domed, I can think about cutting out a circle, you know, and I did this. So it's a little bit bigger. If you look, it slides on there. It's a little bit bigger, so if I slump a, a circle into here, remember when you're um, slumping, let me set this aside so you can see this part of the process. Uh, when you're slumping, you use a stiff, uh, not a wet, but a a drier sponge because it disperses the weight really nicely. Um, if it's wet, you're going to get your piece all gooey. And so you think about how much of a dome you might want on this, and you slump it as much as you may want. I like to use my fingers too. And the cool thing about if you make a mold that, that fits that, or you find a yogurt container that's really close, you can you can trust the mold more, um, unless you make your piece out of a yogurt container that's just perfect, that the line the mold makes, or the line the yogurt container or something makes, um, is where you cut, and you cut under it, so you have a flat spot against a flat spot to score and slip and really manipulate down. So if I look at this, I won't score and slip it yet. I'll just show you how it fits on there to like think about a bottle with a dome and then that, okay? So I have shown you the pie thing also, if you want it more pointy, just taking a circle and cutting a big pie shape out until it makes the the actual cone you want there. And that's another way to think about the top of your bottle body. Bottle body, <laughs> it's weird. All right, so now I'm gonna score and slip that, do that pretty quickly. Again, I do like these tools, but they are not as good as really digging in. Um, sometimes these don't score deep enough. I've learned to really dig in with them um, to make it score deep enough. And I cross hatch over it. Um, but if I feel like the clay is getting a little too stiff, switching to a needle tool. Make sure that you scratch, slip, and stick. Scratch, slip, and stick. Score and slip. Really open that up so you really get that joint back to this wetter, gooier clay. So then this piece and that piece become one rather than fall apart on you. Score it. Little bit. Little big things and even intermediate to some advanced students still don't score enough. So when you're running into cracking around your joints, this is why. Usually um, that's the main reason. The secondary reason could be that you're using clay that's just too dry. Uh, you need to know that when you're scoring and it's crumbling off in a, you know, cookie crumb way, hey, you let your clay get a little too stiff, maybe. For some clays, it works. For some clays, you've got a baby in a little more. So be pretty liberal with the slip at first. Then you can manipulate it off of there a little. But you don't have to leave all that good but there's that bricky laborers term out of australia called good squish when you see two bricks coming together you want to see this so i'll show you what i mean i'll leave it there 
And again, I like to spin it a little so the teeth of the scoring and scratched lines kind of mash and the, the clay doesn't just get together by pressure downward, but by lateral pressure too. Okay, so I'll move it closer and you can see there's good squish, you know, if you've got good squish coming out. Do I wipe it away now? Do I let it sit up? I'm gonna let it sit up and stiffen. Then I'm gonna manipulate and fix that joint. Now this was wet clay, so if I put a spout on here, I have to let it stiffen up. So I suggest making your bodies first, putting them aside, letting them stiffen up, and then start working on your um, necks and or spouts or whatever you're doing. If it's a bottle, again, it's a hollow object. You know, you think about where am I gonna put that neck of the bottle where the cork goes and how tall that neck is. This is a tall form. Maybe I'll make a really tall neck too. Where am I gonna put it? Is it gonna go off to the side? Cause I'm gonna have a, a spout over here. Maybe I'll have like a neck here and a little spout on top. Or maybe I just pour it out of the neck into my mouth or into the pan if it's olive oil. Um, but where do I put it? Wherever you're planning on putting it while the piece is setting up, make sure you poke a hole so the air starts coming out and it doesn't mess up the joints too much, okay? Okay, so that's the basics of the body. Now, I have a full blown thing just on spouts and I show you a variety of different spouts. I'm just gonna go over spout again really quickly here. And here's a different way, you know. You can throw them like I, like I show in that demonstration. I show beak spouts, I show thrown spouts, I show tube spouts. Uh, I'm gonna show you this one where you can think about a doll rod that you either push through the clay or a doll rod that you wrap around the clay. In that spout demo that's on my channel, you can also look at that tube where you just have a coil of clay and you run the dowel rod through it. So a dowel rod or any kind of, again, kind of solid male pattern um, uh, you can use. So I would get a dowel rod at a certain diameter that you want the interior diameter of the spout to be. And you can always open it up a little too with the dowel rod, so it doesn't always have to be exact. So like, this is about the thickness of my finger. And again, I do like those 45s, so maybe I will, when I, I thought I worked as an assistant and courier at Haystack, and she was really particular, particular about her angles, and I really respect that way that she works. It's so cool. Uh, she has wooden patterns with all of these angles. Uh, gets quite uh, anal in a way to work too, you know? So, I mean, does it have to be perfect? I would think that she would say yes, and I would say maybe. It all depends on what you want. So you can see that I'm doing a similar thing, but there's no paper around it and I'm wrapping it around there. And if your clay is at the right consistency, you can get a pretty tight wrap on it. If it starts cracking on these surfaces as you wrap it, it's probably too dry. I don't need this much, so I'm gonna make it shorter by just rolling it like this. Taking that off and I want it like twice as thick. So you will you will sometimes get these surface cracks and you see that, you can rub it out a little, smooth that area out. Okay, so I'm gonna try to keep my dowel rod rolling in the right direction and I can wrap around it and cut it. So I could feasibly make two spouts out of this, right? So you can think about it in terms of even that technique Maybe that was gonna be two bottle bodies and I just cut it in half somewhere. So I'm gonna join that 45 area 
I scored and slipped. Let's pretend I did. I didn't. This clay is wet enough that I don't really think I need to. We'll see after it's bisque. And I'll show you that I make mistakes too sometimes. So. But scoring and slipping, again, I've talked to you about this. It's not always a necessity if you know your clay, you know how to manipulate your clay, and you really compress that joint as you would with a pitch pot. So. so you see me curving this, I'm curving my rib. If you have a metal one, the metal ones work all right too, but I would again suggest that you buy one of these yellow ones are great for the flexibility. The red ones are even more flexible and there's the um, mud tools, there's different brands, but I like Michael Sherrill's ribs a lot. Uh, you can make them too, but getting the material is harder. So what I've done is I've manipulated it to the UV where I've smoothed out all those surface issues that I might have. Now again, I can open it up by rolling this, and it's just like when you use your rolling pin against a slab, but now the rolling pin is on the inside and I can manipulate this spout form, this neck of the bottle, I can manipulate that so I can get it wider on one end if I curve the, the way I pull it or I can try and keep it even if I pull it back straight like this. And it gets wider and wider and what happens is it also gets thinner and thinner so this thickness may be something that you gotta watch for, all right? So when I want to cut it, I want to make sure that my interior joints are really nice and fixed. And I look in there and I use a stiff paintbrush, work that joint. There, it's worked well. I'm going to stick this now back in there because sometimes I've manipulated it in the working of the interior joint. Sometimes it manipulates it. I actually wanted it a little bit bigger. So what I've got is this kind of like a little wider spot here, it narrows and it goes out. It just happened naturally. I'm gonna choose where to now cut that spout. And I'm gonna think about how tall I want it on this body. Um, I'm thinking about this space here where it bellies out and maybe I'm gonna kind of play with that height for the spout because then visually it might balance. So compositional elements are best played out on paper, but you can think about them when you're working on the clay too. So I'm gonna work that around. Sometimes you can draw the line first, but you wanna make sure that your line meets up, you know, when you're cutting the top. So, you want a really nice even top. Um, that's as close as I care about. Um, and then I'm gonna think of again about where it joins there. And then I can actually use this to measure that and get it close like that. That maybe looks a little too tall for me. But if it's that tall, what if I put a handle off of here? And then the height of it then visually would be offset by this element uh, here. All right, so now you can see it gets cut pretty even this way. I might like straighten it out. It's wet clay, so I don't want to manipulate it too much. And again, this piece over here, I will drag it back into the camera. This piece over here is probably a little too wet to do this, but for demonstration purposes, I'm just gonna do it anyway. So again, this looks too tall to me on a visual way, but you can play with that. I mean, it could be even taller, but if I put a handle from here to here, that visual, height will balance out um, 
All right, so I'm going to slip. I'm gonna try not to push down on this dome too much, so I don't want it to cave in. And so I'm telling you, you should have these stiffer, dome, not fresh out of the bag, but maybe in the studio right now, where the way the heat is, maybe a half hour of letting it rest. So letting your bakery rest in baking too. Like letting it rest. You need to have that. Oh, one of my students, Amanda Burry, told another student, and that student was my son. <laughs> uh, said, patience is a virtue, because it is. It's really important in clay. You have to have some patience, slow down, let the world go by, do something else. Uh, is what I like to do. Uh, I, I can have patience because I can, the only time I really believe in multitasking is when I can let one task rest. So I'm gonna let this rest in a perfect world. But again, I didn't want to edit this. And you notice there's no breaks in this video. All right, so there. I put it on there. It's gonna tell me where to mark it. And more importantly, now it's going to tell me where to cut away the top. And again, cutting this away when it's this wet. It's going to lose the integrity. You're going to lose the keystone to your dome, basically. You're going to lose, architecturally speaking, some of the structural strength of this dome. Okay? So, um, be careful. Hopefully that patience is a virtue. Will not bite me in the butt here while I'm trying to make a point that the point is you can get away with. This is 30 minutes to make this piece for me. Yes, I'm explaining it, so it's taking a little longer. This is 30 minutes. So, how much time do you have for this assignment? You know, so as you worked on your other pieces, uh, Think about how much time you spent on waiting for your cups to be ready to put the handles on, for instance, how you have um, elements that might have been the feet on the bowls. Uh, you gotta think about that when you're hand building, think about that when you're throwing, you know, when do you trim your bowls, when do you add the spout to the teapot, when do you add the neck. You throw the neck all at once, you know. So when you get to throwing, that patience is important too. So I'm letting this um, sit a little while I'm working. I should have scored it, slipped it, not just scored it. All right, so I'm working on this area that's going to be where I put my mouth on the bottle or where I'm gonna pour from it. I can think about this area also in terms of a small spout off of it, if I wanted to do that. So maybe I'll do that. So this is this is an oil thing. So if I pinch this, I'm gonna mess with the evenness of this now by pinching and pulling. And you've seen me do that in the spout demo too, making a smaller kind of pitcher spout on here that when I pour the oil, if this is an oil container, you know, whatever you're pouring, it's nice to have a spout, not just the neck. And I'm gonna manipulate it down there. And I'm gonna pinch it back in. Now you can see I now have this, this spout that it can come off of. And I'll work it a little bit more. But. All right, so I'm gonna fix the inside a little, smoothing that out. I'm gonna leave that good squish again to further reiterate and reestablish the fact that you want that good squish coming out. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna again, not gonna push down too much on this dome as to not collapse it. I'm gonna think about a handle here. And that is something with handles I wanna wait. So you see where the spout is? You can see how I could grab this. It doesn't need a handle back here, but a handle here might be nice to pivot. So a handle here, I can put my finger in and I can pivot it 
Um, you can think about handles on pieces as big that are also not just one finger handle. But that's simple, simple ideas around these techniques that I'm showing you here. You can, again, pull any technique out of your toolbox that you've slowly built up over the course of your time with me. And you think about you know, maybe a coil belt element in here or a leather hard slab element. Um, there's ways to go a lot past this, but I want to stick simple and stay within 30 or 40 minutes. So that's uh, a quick demo for you. All right, I hope it helped out a little bit on some knowledge around bottles. Great. Take care, let me know if I can help at all.